Good. Now then, I'd like you to turn with your Bibles, if you have a Bible nearby, to the passage that we're looking at today, which is in Romans and chapter 10. It's the second part of Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 5. It's only just um, a, a number of small number of verses, but we're going to be taking a look at this very, very interesting subject of Israel in the world today. And uh, quite a few people might put their hand up and say, why are we talking about Israel and why are we learning about Israel? Because we're not Israelites, we're Christians. Well, first of all, you're absolutely right, we are Christians. But there is something about looking at the subject of Israel which is very helpful to us. And some of you may think, well, how is it helpful to us? I remember one of us brought up, has brought up on a little council estate in Shrewsbury. And uh, as a young boy, I, be, I was mainly confined to the house until I got to a particular age. And uh, also I discovered that next door there was a little boy that was my friend. And I used to go around and play at his house. But I discovered when I went to his house that things were different. There were things that we were allowed to do there that we weren't allowed to do at our house. There were things that we were not allowed to do there that I could do at my own house. In other words, it was just a different house. <clears throat> and uh, I found it very exhilarating to go to a different house and be under different house rules. Now that little expression, house rules, is actually a biblical expression. And it's the word dispensation. It means house rule. It's a Greek word, oikonomi, it is from, which, from which we get our English word, economy. Very similar word. And we all know that what an economy is. An economy is the way in which a particular environment, a house, for example, or even a, a country, is um, managed. Not just financially, but in all the other ways, the economy, we call it. And um, what's very interesting when you're a Christian is this is that we can look over the wall into next door. And what's in next door? Well, Israel are next door. They're also God's people. They're not at all Christians. Okay? But they are God's people. And it's going to be very helpful to understand who they are and how they have a relationship with God because it's going to enable us to understand more clearly our relationship with God. Just like when I was a little boy, when I went next door and spoke to a different mother and spoke to a different father and different children and I discovered that they did things differently. So when we look over the wall from the church into the synagogue, we find that it's different in the synagogue. They have a different way of thinking. They have a different relationship with God. They're in that relationship with God, okay, but they're not Christians. Then, of course, on the other side of the wall, there's another house, and that's the Gentile house. You see, I discovered when I was a young boy, there wasn't just two houses in my street. There were 400 houses in the estate, and all of the houses were different. Every house was as different as every other. There were some similarities, always but there was an awful lot of differences too and that's what's going to help us here once uh, most christians i would say probably about 99 percent of christians really understand christianity really well we understand what being a christian is we understand what the bible is from our perspective as christians what we've got to remember is that over the wall in the next garden are the jews and they have a bible too and it's the same one and they see the scriptures very differently because they see it from a different perspective. Okay? And between our house and next door, there is a sort of an uneasy peace. Have you ever been in that situation? Where your next door neighbour, you live in a sort of a, an uneasy peace. There are things in which we would agree and things in which we would completely disagree. Okay? And that's what it's like between Christians and Israel. And there is a, there's a general thought today that in the Christian world, there's a number of mistakes people make. They, be, they believe, some people believe, that if you're a Christian, you become an Israelite. And that isn't true. Some people believe that um, the church is like a sort of a, a, an annex of Judaism. And that isn't true. 
Some people believe that they're actually exactly the same thing based on Ephesians chapter 2, but that isn't true. They're not the same thing at all. And we know that they're not the same thing for lots of reasons. First of all, the first one is this. Is that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit didn't baptise all Israel. They just baptised the 120 that were in the upper room. And at the rapture, which we're looking forward to, could be today, when we go to meet the Lord Jesus in the air, it's only going to be Christians that go. Israel are going to be left behind. You say, how can they be left behind? Because they're not Christians. They are God's people, yes, but they're not Christians. And we need to be able to understand and to have a certain amount of clear thinking about who we are and what we do. I remember one day, this is just a little story, I'd been spending a lot of time, it was summer holidays, spent a lot of time next door. And I came into my house and I said, Mum, we need to do this. And she said, young man, she said, they do that next door, we don't do this here. And I said, oh right. <laughs> do you see the point? You can see the point, can't you, how that there's a difference, sometimes a stark difference, between what happens next door and what happens in your home. And the same is true with the church. What happens in the church sometimes is very different to what happens in Israel. Now we're going to start at verse 5. We got up to verse 4 last week. This is paragraph 20 in the book of Romans. And I've called it Believing in Christ. I'll just read the verse for you. It says, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. And then in verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. And I go to verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh unto thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. Now I've missed out verse 7 there specifically because verse 7 is a parenthesis about an incorrect idea. And we don't need to concentrate on the incorrect idea. We're going to stay with the correct idea. So then, in the New Testament, you will always find a contrast between Israel and the church. It's always a contrast always um, he talks in verse 5 about the righteousness of the law now there are lots of Christians that would say oh no there's no such thing as the righteousness of the law well there's a passage that says there is there was a righteousness of the law and those who were under the law had to live by the law the man who keeps the law lives by the law and we're talking there about Jews go and speak to any Jew has anybody ever met a Jew yeah, a few. Have you met a Jew, sir? Yes. Whenever you speak to a Jew, you'll get the correct understanding of how they think. Because they know what they think. They'll tell you what they think. And they will tell you that they're under the law and that they've got to keep the law. And what the Apostle Paul would say is, yes. And that comes directly from Moses. Verse, verse 5 says, Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man who does these things shall live by them. So then, if you're a Jew and you're under the law, then this is it. God expects you to keep it. Now, if you keep the law, you're not going to become saved that way, but you will be designated by God as a righteous man. Whenever you look through the Bible and you hear about a righteous man, it's always someone that keeps the law. Now that doesn't mean to say the person's perfect, because when they sin, they go along to the temple and they make a sacrifice for sin, and they walk away with a clear conscience because their sin has been put out of sight. But there was a righteousness of the law. But I want you to notice a little word. What's the first word of verse 6? But... Do you know what? We need to take very careful attention sometimes in the Bible to what I call the joining words like and or but. OK, now that little word but always is a contrast. You see, it's a lovely day outside, but it's going to rain. See the contrast? Or you could say it's a really nice day outside, but I'm going to be stuck, in, stuck inside all day. See, the but is always a contrast. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says, Moses describes the righteousness of the law, but 
The righteousness which is of faith talks like this. And in verse 8, this is what the law says. That the word is nigh unto thee, in thy mouth, in thy heart, and that is the word of faith which we preach. So what he's doing there, Paul is describing two sorts of righteousness. In, in Philippians chapter chapter 3, I think it is, he, he outlines this very, very clearly when you read it. He says, I want to be found in him, not having the righteousness of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And he's saying exactly the same here. What he's saying here is this is that all those people are speaking to everybody in this building here and you're in, all in the church okay? and you're all the unworthy you're all the people that would disclaim God's worthiness every single one of us would say God I am not worthy of your salvation I am unclean I am defiled and I should be cast out of your presence and he says yes exactly that's what qualifies you for grace because grace is the unmerited kindness of God to those that are unworthy, hell-deserving, vile and filthy sinners. That's what the grace of God is. We are all those that are of the unworthy. And Paul said, when I was a Jew, he said I was the very height. Nobody could even point a finger at me and find any fault in me. But I took all of that righteousness of the law and I put it in the trash can. Why? That I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having the righteousness of the law, but the righteousness that comes to the unworthy sinner by faith in Christ. So isn't that amazing? It's amazing that God is able to do something quite unusual in the world today. For 2,000 years, God has been doing something extraordinary. And it's called grace. It's not what he normally does. In fact, outside of the church, God is not doing this at all. God doesn't have grace to those that are not Christians. To those that are not Christians, it's law. He will hold them accountable for what they do. But in the church... He says, I know what you've done and everything that you've done would disqualify you for my blessing. So I'm going to have to bless you on another principle. I'm going to have to give it you for free on the basis of the fact that I just love you. What an amazing God we have. Now in verse 9, he clarifies this a little bit. <clears throat> And, it, and you know, don't you, that in these couple of chapters, what Paul is doing is he's, he's explaining what Israel's position is in the present age in which we live. And it wouldn't surprise you, would it, that the people who received this letter, if they were Jews, would really read these passages very carefully and very intently because they wanted to understand what God would have to say to them through Paul. And, and so what Paul does, he explains how pe people become Christians, but he does it within the context of Judaism. I'll explain what I mean. He says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now just stop a moment. Think, think about this for a moment. He's speaking to people that are Jews. That's what this whole passage is about. And he's explaining to them how to get saved. So therefore, there's some obvious thing that we are missing here. And the obvious thing is this. That the Jews are not saved. We've got that now. The Jews are not saved. They're not saved like Christians are saved. Because Christians are saved under grace and there's no salvation like Christians have under law. So they're the unsaved. And so what he's saying is, look you Jews, if you want to be saved, then you have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And you have to believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead. And then you will be saved. Now there's lots of people in the world that will say, oh that's very presumptuous. I remember many, many years ago as a young Christian, I was talking to a person, he was a member of the Church of England, we were talking about the Bible, and I said, of course, I'm saved. And he looked at me like that and he went, you're saved? 
How presumptuous. How can you possibly presume to say that you're saved? I said, I'm not presuming it. I'm believing in it. And I'm not basing it upon my feelings or my ideas. I'm basing it upon what Jesus Christ said. And what Paul is saying is here, is that if, if a Jew confesses with his mouth the Lord Jesus and believes in his heart that God has raised him from the dead, then he is saved. And let me notice something here. When a Jew believes in the Lord Jesus like that, there is a sense in which he then ceases to be a Jew and becomes a Christian. You say, well, doesn't he remain a Jew? Well, he sort of does in the flesh remain a Jew. He's still got a mother, hasn't he? That's a Jewess. Still got children. But in his heart, he's become a Christian. And so now he's saved. And that salvation separates himself, separates him from the nation in which he was a Jew. And there's something else I want to say. Some people may say, well, why does Paul put these two conditions, okay, upon the Jews in order to become saved? Well, the first one is this. They must confess the Lord Jesus. Now, what the Jewish nation did as a nation, led by their leaders, okay, is they rejected the Lord Jesus. That's the standing that the Jewish nation took about Christ. They said, like the parable says, we will not have this man to reign over us. And what did they do? They said he's worthy to die and they crucified him. That's rejection of the Lord Jesus. Now then, that's... And, 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 and the people were very bold. They said to Pilate, let his blood be on us and upon our people. That's a terrible thing to say. And his blood has been upon them and upon their people all down these centuries. But the important thing is this. If a Jew wants to become a Christian, if he wants to be saved, he has to reverse this in his personal life. He has to stand up before his Jewish friends and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Now they will all ostracize him and some of them might even seek to kill him for his faith in Christ. But the important thing is this, that he has to do it. You see, you can't be a Christian and deny that Jesus is the Christ. The Messiah of Israel. Can't do that. And if you want a Jew and you want to become a Christian, you want to be saved, in other words, then you have to be able to make that public declaration. And for the Jews, that public declaration was very much about the Christian baptism, which they exercised. It was a public declaration that they were united to Christ. There's also a second thing, very specific for Jews. He notices, he says, and shall believe in thine heart, what? That God has raised him from the dead. See, why, why not the cross? Because, you see, it was the resurrection that the Jews denied. They all knew that he died on the cross. But it was put around, the lie was put around, that the disciples came... Uh, when it was dark and stole the body. Now he says, if you're a Jew and you want to be saved, you have to do two things. You have to make a public declaration of your faith in Christ and you have to believe in your heart that God did raise him from the dead. Now, it's not the fact that these are the only things to believe and it's not the fact that Gentiles don't believe these things either. It's just that these two things for the Jew are the sticking point. You see the point? These are the bits where the Jews get stuck. And so that's why it's emphasized by the Apostle Paul in their conversion experience. In verse 10 he goes on to explain, he says, With the heart a man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what he's saying is this, he says, when a man believes in his very heart in the Lord Jesus, then he is declared to be righteous with God. Because in the heart the man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see, you can't be a Jew like Nicodemus might have been in the early days and be a denier of who he is in front of his brethren. He says he was a secret disciple. Well, you can't be a secret disciple. You have to come out fully 
If you're a Jew and declare where your colours stand, they stand with the Jewish Messiah. Now, in this passage, there's a lot of scripture references. You would expect that when God is speaking through the Apostle Paul to the Jews, it would be full of scripture references. There's probably an allusion to over 16 references in the Old Testament in just the six, 14 references in just the 16 verses. It's packed full of it. Because this is not based upon Paul's ideas. This is rooted and based upon Old Testament teaching. He says in verse 11, For the scripture says, Whoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Okay. Now that doesn't mean to say, Will not be ashamed before their brethren. They will be ashamed before their brethren. But they will not be ashamed before my Father in heaven. Christ speaks about this in the Gospels. He talks about those who confess him and who deny him before men. Then in verse 12 he says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Now this is a classic verse that's taken wrongly and misunderstood. And we need to have, as I said earlier, we need to have clear thinking about what the Bible is saying. You see, both Jew and Gentile come into Christian salvation the same way, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ is the same Lord, and he is rich unto all that call upon him. That's what he's saying. But I tell you what the verse is not saying. The verse is not to be taken to mean that the church and Israel are the same. He says there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto who? <coughs> all that call upon him. Right. So, when a person becomes a Christian, when they become in Christ, where they came from makes no difference. You might be a Christian that was previously a Jew. Or you might be a Christian that previously was a Gentile. When you become a Christian, it's just the same. What the verse is not saying is that in the present world today, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Go and ask a Jew. Go to the Mount of Olives. Stand there and ask the first person that walks down the road, say, excuse me, can you tell me, are Jews and Gentiles the same? Well, they'll probably slap you in the face. You see, there's a vast difference. They see a vast, vast difference between a Jew and a Greek. There is no difference between a Jew and a Greek when they become Christians. That's the point. When they become Christians. But outside of Christianity, vast difference. And the reason why there's no difference is because in verse 13 he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and that little word whosoever there it means this he says whether you are a Jew or whether you are a Gentile you are all the same you are saved you shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved verse 14 how then shall they call on him on whom they have not believed this is great this is a whole series of four questions in fact there are five stages to evangelism you may not have realized that there are five stages the first stage is that God calls the preacher so I didn't know that had to happen yes you see people who are Christians are called by the Lord to be preachers of the message you cannot be a preacher of the message until the Lord spurs you in your heart to do so it's a very important feature. The second stage is that the preacher preaches the gospel. That's the second stage. The third stage is that the, the gospel preacher is heard okay, by the person that's a sinner. The fourth stage is that the person that hears the gospel believes in the gospel. And the last stage is the sinner hears the gospel and calls upon the Lord for salvation. See, I didn't know there were so many steps. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few steps. You see, no, one, no, no Christian ever becomes a Christian without the Holy Spirit at work. He never becomes a Christian without hearing the, the word of God. And he never becomes a Christian without the man of God. You see that? And it's all about 
the Son of God. See, that it's all it's all united, isn't it? So the Holy Spirit will be involved. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit was involved in you becoming a Christian. If you're a Christian, then it was the gospel, the word of God, that was involved in you becoming a Christian. If you're a Christian, then it was the Holy Spirit of God that was involved in you becoming a Christian. If you're a Christian, then it's about the message of the Son of God that brought you into this. But there's one other thing. The man of God. We mustn't forget the man of God. The man of God is the preacher of the gospel. And not just anyone is a man of God. Every believer can be a man or woman of God, yes. But it's the man of God that is called of the Lord to be a preacher of the gospel. And then he says, uh, just a little bit of a side thing, he says, as it is written, how beautiful, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. There is something indescribably beautiful to God about the feet of those who bring the gospel message. And of course, what that means is, it's referring to their, their traveling, their walking, their running to meet you to bring the gospel message. Now, verse 16, we have another word. If you've got a proper Bible, it'll say the word, but. Okay, another but. You see, we've had this wonderful description about how to be a Christian and about how evangelism works but then we have this word but but they have not all obeyed the gospel okay you see when the gospel was first preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost and by others too there was a lot of people who became Christians but not all Israel did some people even, even heard the words of Christ and still didn't listen you see the point? You see, Israel did not respond to the gospel when they heard it. If Israel had responded to the gospel when they heard it, then the whole of Israel would be the church. But that, of course, isn't the case, is it? Not all Israel is the church. There are horrible people in Israel today, and there are people that just don't believe in God. Or maybe they believe in God, but not in Jesus Christ, his son. See the point? So not all Israel are Christians that's a very important thing and this is the division between Israel and the church and the thing that divides Israel and the church well there's lots of things we've talked about Pentecost we've talked about the rapture but there's something that's much more fundamental than that it's faith in Christ every single Christian has faith in Christ but not every Jew does there are some those that have faith in Christ, what are they then? Well, they're Christians, of course. Okay, so then, that's the great division between the church and Israel. Now, is this consistent with the Old Testament? Yes, it is. In fact, Paul is going to call on a number of witnesses from the Old Testament to clarify and to confirm that what he says is true. He says, for Isaiah says, who has believed our report? Who did believe in it? He foretold, the, the prophet of old, 400 years before, he foretold the fact that when the gospel evangelists went out, they wouldn't be believed. They would not be believed. Okay? Verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So what Paul is doing is concluding his whole argument in verse 17. He says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let me just, as a little side note here. Faith does not come as a matter of fate from a God who just makes you have faith against your will. That's absolutely inconsistent with scripture. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, by the preaching of the gospel. Whenever we see the expression, the word of God, we're not talking about the Bible. We're talking about the preached message. Verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth, and their words to the end of the earth. So the question is this, did Israel hear the word? Yes. The twelve apostles and all of their assistants and helpers, they went into all the known world. They went, what they would, what would they would say, to the end of the world. What the end of the world means, it's the end of the civilized world. Of course, there were 
tribes beyond that but they went to the very end of the Roman Empire and they preached the gospel so they did here okay but verse 18 sorry verse 19 but I say did not Israel know well first Moses said I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation will I anger you so this is the first witness against them Moses said a long long time ago back in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament the early part of the Old Testament he said there will come a day in the future when I will provoke Israel to jealousy by them that are not of this ethnic group that's the word people it's ethnos okay so Israel in the present day then if you want to describe what Israel is in the present day there's a few words you could use first one is jealous they're jealous of the Christian church they look over the wall back into the church and they say oh look at all this these people are all Christians they're all declared righteous when they're not righteous that's amazing we're jealous of that we were never able to fully achieve righteousness that they've got so they're jealous he says I will provoke you to jealous jealousy by a people that are not a people and also by a foolish nation in other words he says I will anger you so the relationship between the church and Israel today in the present dispensation is jealousy and anger jealousy and anger they are jealous of our relationship with God and they are angry with their covenant God for allowing such filthy unworthy and unholy Gentiles into the blessings of God that is the way in which they are today verse 20 Isaiah is very bold he says I was found of those that sought me not and I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me so who are the people that didn't seek after the Lord it's the Gentiles that's us who were the people that, that were not asking after the Lord it's us Gentiles we weren't looking for the Lord and yet the Lord came looking for us and found us that's wonderful isn't it were you looking for the Lord before you got saved I wasn't he came looking for me you see in the Old Testament the, the expression is seek ye the Lord while he may be found in the New Testament the, the concept is that he came looking for people that weren't looking for him now, that's quite a different thing isn't it and in verse 24 but to Israel he saith and this is the last verse of the chapter he says all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people do you know I could nearly weep at a passage like this notice that little word at the beginning but contrast you see he's talked about those Gentiles that came into the church when they weren't even looking for the Lord but he says about Israel he says all day long I stretch out my hand to them he wants to touch them I stretch forth my hands the two I stretch forth unto a disobedient and gain what's it mean disobedient it means they won't do as they're told and they're always answering back isn't that what my mother used to say to me she said Stephen you won't do as you're told and you're always answering back I expect probably you're very similar mothers say these things don't they but that's what God's relationship with Israel is in the present age he says they're disobedient what's it mean disobedient it means they will not keep the Lord even though they promise to keep it and when I speak to them about it through my prophets he says they answer back they're rude they ignore the prophets they argue with the prophets and in the end they kill the prophets wow now there will be some people that will say oh this is all anti-semitic no <laughs> the apostle Paul was certainly not anti-semitic and nor am I I love Israel however we must understand what God the Holy Spirit says about them in the present era he says they are disobedient and they are gainsaying you say how's, gonna, how's God going to change that around I'll tell you how he's going to change them around when I didn't do as I was told and when I always answered back I had a thrashing from my father and from my mother that's how 
And what the Lord Jesus is going to do, he's going to descend from heaven, but before he does so, he will thrash Israel thoroughly in the tribulation in such a way that they will repent of what they've done, they will not answer back anymore, and they will keep the law, and then he will be restored to them. What a restoration that will be. And this people who in the present day are low am I, not my people. The Lord has spewed them out of his mouth. He spewed them out of the land. He said, get away from my face. I can't do with you. You are idolatrous. You're, un you're unrighteous in my sight. He'll then whistle them like a shepherd whistles for his sheep that have gone into another pasture. And he'll whistle and they will come back to him. And he'll bring them all back into the land. And then what will he do? He'll put his arms around them and forgive them. And then when he's forgiven them, he will put his spirit within them. And they'll never sin like that again. They will never go away from the Lord for all eternity. What a tremendous God we have. Can you understand the immensity of the love of God? He doesn't just love Christians. It's wonderful he loves Christians. But he loves his ancient wayward people. He loves the ones that even crucified his son. And he wants to bring them back. And he'll bring them back into the land. And he'll establish Israel as the head of all the nations of the world. And through Israel... Under the terms of the Abrahamic covenant, through Israel and through the Lord Jesus, he'll bring blessing to every single family in all the world. What an amazing program God has for the future. Now that's given us a lot to think about. I highly recommend, you know, when we have these sermons like this, that you go home and read the passage and read it and read it and read it. Let it sink into your heart. Let God speak to you about what he's having to say in the passage at the time.